My name is Sukh Simranjit Singh. I promise you that's going to be the hardest thing for you to remember all day. <laughs> Sukh Simran is a short form, very short. Anyway, so I'm the managing director for the Strauss Institute. Honored, privileged, blessed to be here in this amazing gathering. Thank you, first of all, all of you for joining us at Appreciating Our Legacy and Engaging the Future Conference. Can we give a round of applause to everyone who's here? I'm here only to do a short MC of the stage this morning. My first job is to introduce our Dean, Professor Dean Paul Karen. And he told me to read this line from his bio. No, he did not. <laughs> Dean Paul Karen was named the third most influential person in legal education by the National, National Jurist in 2015, and one of the 100 most influential people in tax and accounting every year since 2006 by Accounting Today. Dean Paul Carroll. Thank you, Tuxemaran. I am thrilled to welcome you here for this wonderful conference. Um, I joined the faculty at Pepperdine seven years ago, and I'm still learning how to use a microphone. <laughs> and I, I became Dean uh, two years ago. And in that time, I've often referred to the House Institute for Dispute Resolution as the crown jewel of Pepperdine Law School. I've done that for two reasons. The first is that our dispute resolution program is the highest ranked program at the law school, just barely beating out tax by a whisker. Um, <laughs> I'm a tax guy for those of you who don't know. Um, the second reason is that 35 percent of our incoming 1Ls say that they would have chosen another law school if Pepperdine did not have the Strauss Institute. That's higher than 28 percent who say they would not have chosen Pepperdine if it were not a faith-based law school. And the 26 percent who say they would not have come here if we were not located in Malibu. <laughs> so in their minds, the dispute resolution is more important than God and the beach. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa! I recently visited London, and I, I stood in line for over an hour at the Tower of London because I'm a good husband, um, and we saw the crown jewels of England. I saw that they were kept under tight security and behind glass. So it occurred to me that I'd been wrong uh, to refer to this Rouse Institute as the crown jewel. Um, and indeed, uh, for all of you that are involved in this important work of conflict resolution and peacemaking, you see, your work is done in the real world involving real people with real problems. Our country and our world have never been more in need of people who teach, research, and practice conflict resolution and peacemaking. Indeed, I cannot think of another area of law that, that is more important in 2019 and beyond. And after reading through the list of folks who are here, I cannot think of a more important gathering of teachers, scholars, and practitioners. So on, on behalf of Pepperline Law School, thank you for honoring us with your presence here. I look forward to the conversations and discussions over the next two days about the past, present, and future of this vital school, of this vital field at this vital law school. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Karen. What makes this conference unique is the cooperation and collaboration. It is not just us at the Pepperdine University School of Law, Strauss Institute. It is all of you, terrific programs around the nation that are joining us, strengthening us, being with us today, supporting each one of us. So it is a joint effort. We thank you all. I will 
go away from my notes for 10 seconds, allow me. There are some teachers I want to thank who have made me who I am, and I have a long way to go. Professor Len Riskin, Professor John Landy, Professor Ken Fox, Professor Leela Love, Professor Jim Corbin is absent, I think. Uh, these are teachers who, who have taught me a lot, and I'm blessed to be in this amazing presence of teachers. One of the new teachers that who has taught me a lot, his name is Professor Tom Stepanovich. He also happens to be the Associate Dean for the Strauss Institute of Pepperdine Law and co-chair of this conference. And he is wise, he is hardworking, one of the most hardworking persons I know. He is an amazing teacher, a gifted scholar, but he's also an amazing, talented drawer, an architect, a thinker, a philosopher, and a friend, Professor Tom Stepanovich. Well, thank you so much. I, I hope you don't mind uh, that we transferred the venue of the conference from uh, Malibu to uh, the Scottish Highlands this morning. Uh, so welcome to Scotland. Um, you know, I fancy that, uh, you know, I'm in Scotland in the mornings and in the afternoon, hopefully the sun will come out and you'll be back in California. But, uh, but in any event, it's a joy, a joy to see all of you here today. Uh, last night, uh, when uh, we first saw a group of you uh, who came in last night uh, who were speaking in this conference, I was, I was just reminded of the reasons why we started this effort more than a year ago. Um, Andrea Schneider, who you will see shortly, who will be moderating our first uh, uh, program this morning, actually is uh, the inspiration for, or should receive the blame for, uh, this conference because uh, it was she who planted the seed uh, at last year's American Bar Association dispute resolution section meeting. We had had a wonderful conversation about a lot of the challenges that are confronting uh, law schools and dispute resolution programs uh, at present uh, and uh, looking forward uh, t on a number of issues. And Andrea came up and said, Tom, I think it's time for another conference at Pepperdine. I'm curious to see how many of you uh, here attended our conference uh, on teaching back in 2011. Please raise your hands. Let me see your hands. Many, many people here. It was, uh, to me, a wonderful conference that focused on the classroom uh, techniques for, for conveying skills and insights. And it was a wonderful, very rich, and I thought creative uh, program. Uh, my colleague Peter Robinson put that together. Uh, along with Jay Fulberg and Dwight Golan. And uh, we had, again, many of you involved in that. This time, it's going to be a bit different. You know, many of us uh, are coming to an age and to a point in our career where we're really thinking about where we have come as a field. Uh, my own uh, experience is almost uh, precisely coterminous with what I call and you get tired of me saying this, the quiet revolution in dispute resolution. Uh, and I have been blessed to have a front row seat. Uh, and um, riding the wave, sometimes overwhelmed by the wave, but it's, uh, it's a marvelous, marvelous time to be focused on what we're doing. It's also, as Dean Karen said, a very challenging time. I'm sure many of us wonder, where are we right now? What is our role at a time when the world uh, seems to be moving downhill? towards some kind of precipice. And I ask myself, uh, what is the highest and best use of the skills and insights uh, that we have embraced and learned uh, together over the last few years? As I look around the room, uh, I see the history of our profession and our field. Uh, people, as Suk Semron said, the people who have taught him uh, and who have laid the groundwork for a new generation of teachers, of mediators, of facilitators, of managers of conflict, problem solvers, diplomats, peacemakers. Uh, and we are also going to be looking ahead and talking about this very challenging future and how we confront it. Uh, I, at this point, want to thank two wonderful co-sponsors. Uh, the first step in setting up this conference was really to enlist uh, the involvement of the American Bar Association section on dispute resolution, and Nancy will say a bit more about the ABA in a few minutes. I also have to tell you that this would not have been possible 
uh, without my two co-organizers. Uh, and the first is Nancy Welch. You know, last fall, I had the opportunity as a Hagler Fellow to visit Nancy and her colleagues. Uh, it was actually at the law school and the architecture school at Texas A&M, but mainly with my friends at the law school. And I want to acknowledge uh, all of the folks from A&M who are here. I think there are six of you today. Nancy, um, could we have the uh, folks from Texas A&M please stand? Carol Pauly, uh, Guillermo Garcia Sanchez, Peter Riley, uh, and let's say, oh, and of course, Cynthia Alcon, uh, and I believe Michael Green will be here before long. So, uh, so anyway, welcome. <laughs> you know, Nancy Welch knows everybody. And I said, uh, if we're going to create a conference like this, Nancy has to be involved. And Nancy and I, I think, met at least weekly uh, during the fall. Uh, to prepare this conference, and we reached out to many of you. And, you know, everything needs to be organic now, and we thought the conference should be. So we decided to plant seeds, and they grew, and here we are. Uh, and last night, I began to feel the fruits of that, of that effort, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I can't be more pleased. Uh, I also want to thank my, my Strauss Pepperdine colleagues, uh, Suksimran Singh, who is our, uh, has really blossomed as our uh, second managing director of the, of the institute. Um, and I'd like to ask my Pepperdine Strauss Institute colleagues to please stand. Uh, the, the Strauss family is a terrific, terrific group of people. So. And if you, if you don't already know them, I hope you will get to know them uh, during the next couple of days and during this week. As many of you know, this is also our annual professional skills program. Well, with that, I'm going to turn back the microphone uh, to my colleague, Professor Singh. Let me simply conclude by saying, once again, uh, this was a conference I wanted to attend. It's the conference that looks at where we've been and where we're going. And I hope that it will plant further seeds and we all will be engaged in many different efforts that reflect back on what began here. Thank you so much. We cannot conclude our introduction without inviting Professor Nancy Welsh, Professor of Law, Director of AG Dispute Resolution Program at Texas A&M. She's been a wonderful colleague, a leader in organizing this conference, and Professor Stepanovich and Professor Welsh has been the pioneers for putting this together and for bringing you all here. Professor Nancy Welsh. The day is here. It's so exciting to look out and see all of you here, all of my wonderful colleagues. And what gracious co-organizers we have with Suk Sumran and Tom Stepanovich. I am here primarily to speak on behalf of the ABA Section of Dispute Resolution and the Texas A&M uh, Aggie Dispute Resolution Program. Um, Tom mentioned that uh, this has been an organic process, uh, and it has been. It has been organic also because so many of you come from cooperating institutions. Um, those of you who uh, are from one of the cooperating institutions, thank you very much uh, for the work that you have done in preparing to uh, organize and moderate sessions, as well as the work you are going to be doing uh, during these next two days, and um, ultimately, we hope, uh, in putting together blog posts that help the rest of the world who couldn't be here uh, learn a little bit more about what happened during these two days. Um, Tom did a wonderful job in describing um, some of our thinking um, as to why we wanted to put on these two days, as well as acknowledging Andrea as the seed for this. Um, but I wanted to add a couple of things, and that is, in some ways when you look around the room, when I look in certain parts of the room, I see um, blonde and brown hair. When I look in other parts of the room, I see a lot of gray hair. When I look in the mirror, I see a lot of gray hair. <laughs> and um, at this point, both in our evolution as teachers and scholars and practitioners, and also just our evolution as human beings, you start thinking about 
what you've been doing over the course of your life, why you've chosen the path that you've chosen, what difference you think you've made for the future. And in some ways, I hope that part of these two days will allow us to think about those things. But then also you look forward, which is, and what difference will this make? And I hope during these couple of days for myself, and I hope this for you as well, that because of your presence and your insights and our opportunity to really be with each other, that there will be some light bulbs that will go off regarding an understanding of what has happened and why and what needs to be done. And I also hope that there will be some paths that we start to see that we want to travel together, whether it's in terms of teaching or in terms of research, um, or in terms of service, service that is sorely needed in parts of the world. And ultimately, I hope uh, that we will see some of the fruits of this emerge in, I gotta say it, the ABA section of dispute resolutions, <laughs> annual conference or various institutes, um, as well as collaborations uh, among all of us. And finally, uh, in the service that we can provide both in the courts and in the larger world. So. Let's do good work during these two days, good work that helps prepare us for the good work we will be doing in the future. Thanks very much for being here. I will request three of my colleagues to stand briefly, if you may. Laurie Rushford, Jenny Ruth, Chris Shea. Three of them are responsible for putting all the logistics together, so thank you. <laughs> we need last minute, and there's an important announcement to make. Um, the colleague and friend I spoke about earlier, the teacher, Professor Stepanovich, as I said, he's also an artist, and he, since he cared a lot about this conference, decided to draw a new portrait for each one of you. So right now, we're gonna unveil that portrait that you'll be receiving at the conference. <laughs> Professor Stepanovich. With that, we will be proceeding with our first um, panel, the plenary A, so chairs, please come on to the dais, thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's always a little risky uh, when somebody takes a crazy idea at the end of a conference and runs with it. Uh, so, so thanks all for coming along when uh, Tom agreed that this would be a good idea and to host this. And uh, I am very grateful to him, to Sue, to Nancy, uh, and to the entire Pepperdine team for pulling this off. Um, I, I should say probably if there's a lot of success, you should give them all credit. And if you find at the end of 48 hours, not so much, then tell me my ideas should stay within my head next time and <laughs> not be vocalized. And you know, that's, that's the risk there of talking to your friends. Um, but I am uh, very grateful for the opportunity this morning uh, to work with our illustrious panel. Uh, I'm gonna move quickly, because I know we are already time pressed, um, but I do wanna welcome everybody and Thank everybody for coming. Our first panel this morning talks about appreciating our legacy. Uh, and so there is uh, both the opportunity to set the stage for the next couple days, uh, as well as a little bit of pressure, right? If we run over, we just ruin it for everybody else. Uh, if we you know, kind of only say depressing things, that, that's not necessarily all that fun either. Uh, so um, there's there, no pressure to be the first plenary in the morning, right? Everybody, no pressure, you're feeling totally ready to talk, and for me to cut you off. Um, so I should be really clear, right? We have this amazing illustrious panel. I am not going to take the time to read the bios because that would take the 75 minutes of our plenary to properly go through and introduce everybody. 
Um, we have a series of questions that we are going to try to get through. And to do that means that um, you all in the audience, as no doubt our speakers, are going to be unsatisfied. Uh, because each person is going to have about, oh, three minutes to answer a question that should take 35, 45. Feel free to ask them at breaks and later on breakouts more information about their answer, um, which I will ever so graciously cut them off at three minutes uh, so that uh, we can hear from everybody on this panel. But I want to recognize that they themselves are being uh, real team players in being short and to the point so that we can try to move around and, uh, and recognize that with all of you in the audience, um, this is probably not a, as a complete answer as they themselves would like. Um, so with all of that, uh, let me, we're gonna start off with a couple big questions. Uh, and the first one is really about uh, what are the major legacies as we are looking back uh, and appreciating our legacies, uh, thinking about what are the major legacies, we're gonna turn to Carrie Minkle-Meadow and then Doug Yarn uh, for weighing in on that. So Carrie, you can get us started. So I'm always short, but I always talk a lot, so I'm gonna cram a lot into my New York fast-paced talking. Um, reflecting on where we've been, and I was one of the founders of this field, um, I want to take you back to the beginning and what I've described in some of my writing as a moment of intellectual convergence. While I was here on the West Coast at UCLA writing about problem solving uh, for lawyers, uh, and Roger Fisher and Bill Urey and Bruce Patton were at Harvard writing Getting to Yes, it was a moment for me uh, that as someone who teaches about the sociology of science was like the discovery of DNA, an intellectual convergence. Something was happening in the world that made people unhappy with binary, brittle decision-making um, and win-lose in law lawyering. I was teaching trial advocacy. I'd been a trial lawyer. I'd been a civil rights lawyer. I had won a lot of cases in court that didn't solve the problem. You've all read that, I hope, or you soon will. And we're in a similar moment now. So it was a time of paradigm shifting. And I would say to consider what our legacies um, have been, Consider that yesterday I was asked to tape a segment for Marketplace, the radio program, I don't know when it's going to be on, to help talk to children about what it is that our field has accomplished. And as children and young people would say today, think about how many memes our field has created. Problem solving, integrative bargaining, uh, communication, speaking, mediation. These are things that are now, or were for the last 40 years in the culture. Um, and to uh, put it very pointedly, a challenge that I want to place to all of you for the next two years, two days, sorry, it's going to take more than two years, <laughs> is um, uh, we're in a very troubled time. I do a lot of work internationally, uh, and it's a very bad time in Europe where I've just spent six months. I'm going back on Monday. Uh, Europe's falling apart. I was in England for Brexit. Uh, we are, as I was driving up here this morning listening to Wendy Sherman, who negotiated the uh, Iran nuclear uh, deal, uh, we're on the brink of war, if you haven't listened to the news. I'm sorry to be a downer early in the morning. But um, the question is, what can our field, what has our field done? We've contributed me memes, we've contributed ideas, and everyone in this room, uh, most of you have been teaching now, many of you, for decades, to try to teach the next generation to look at problem solving differently. So um, whether we're getting to yes, or to maybe, or unfortunately to war, the challenge is, um, what have our MEMS actually accomplished um, the good news, every law school in the country, every law school, now teaches some form of negotiation, mediation, ADR, problem solving. I'm teaching problem solving and decision making and professional judgment as an offshoot of this field. Um, but the question for us is twofold for me, and then I'll stop. Intellectually, what are the new ideas that this field has produced in the last few years? We have been terrific at the beginning of founding our field with a whole series of MEMS that reoriented, hopefully, the way many lawyers and diplomats and decision makers in government and decision makers in business and industry and in labor unions who do integrative bargaining. We did change the way many people thought about things. But I challenge you to think about what um, really new ideas have come out of our field um, in the last few years. I think we've been working off of our old memes and the world is definitely in need of new ones. So I hope for the younger ones of you who are both scholars and practitioners, um, you will help us think through why the memes that we've used for the last 40 years 
are actually uh, not in ascendance at the moment. The rhetoric in government, in international affairs, uh, led by our lovely president, um, are not peacemaking. They are warmongering, trade wars. They are the language of aggression and beating and bullying. Um, and the question is, what intellectual ideas can we offer to counter that at the intellectual level of idea creation? And then secondly, um, what can we do so that we're not only uh, preaching to our own particular choirs, and we all have them in our law schools, business schools, undergraduate programs that teach in political science as well. Um, how can we push forward these ideas so that they go beyond the people who are already peacemakers and people who want to make love and peace and the world make the world better? I, I think we are really in desperate need um, of new ideas intellectually and new practices and new educational programs. I'll just end by saying, again, somewhat of a downer, I'm afraid. I spent a lot of time teaching abroad now, and you might be interested to know that in Europe, a number of the law schools at which I teach have now made negotiation a required course for all law students. Um, understanding that the modern world requires students to learn early on in their study of law, and law, recall, for those of you who don't know, is an undergraduate subject in most other universities. So the programs I've been teaching at are universities that have 4,000 students, uh, University of Buenos Aires, 30,000 students. So when you decide to make every student who wants to study law, study negotiation and problem solving, you are reaching a much broader audience. I've been working on trying to get some of these ideas and subjects uh, mandatory, I know, not a, not a voluntary subject in ADR, but mandatory in, um, in my own law schools, uh, unsuccessfully. Um, and in fact, I would say that interest these days in some schools, which is one of the reasons we're here, is actually down. Um, and uh, wanting to be a trial lawyer is, uh, is, is up, even though, as you all know, less than 2% of all civil cases go to trial. Um, right, so Carrie, I'm, yeah, gonna... I'm, gonna stop. I'm just going to say, while we talk about what we do, <laughs> Gary, I love you. <laughs> um, it might be useful for everyone else in this room, and I know there are many of you who teach abroad, to think about why is it that other countries have been more, far more successful in making the things that we teach a required subject than we have. We have not accomplished that. Great. Thank you very much, Carrie. <laughs> And, and the reason to start off with Carrie is that she has now laid the groundwork really for the purpose of the entire plenary in which we're really talking about what are our legacies, successes, failures, and where are we going from here in order to then lead to our next plenary. Um, and now I'm going to turn to Doug to give us a different perspective. That's um, a tough I act <laughs> to follow. I yep. seed my time. <laughs> Well, that's one way to keep us on uh, schedule, your call. <laughs> I, you know, the interesting thing about uh, teaching overseas, and many of you have, is that uh, law, if you're going to go into politics or public uh, administration, all that stuff, you, you, you go through an undergraduate law degree. So I, I think there's a bigger effect when we get, the, get them at that uh, stage. I, I, I like the way you start off with intellectual congruence. I like to kind of pick up from that. Uh, and I'd like to narrow the aperture just a little bit from the larger conflict resolution aperture to uh, the ADR aperture. Uh, and looking back 40 plus years, the Pound Conference, for example, that uh, we're looking at ADR as a subset of the conflict resolution movement. It's a different scale. Uh, it's alternatives to litigation of civil legal disputes. That's where I want to put the focus for the time being, right or wrong, in domestic rather than international, I think, for the moment. So I look at, uh, when you talk about intellectual congruence, uh, convergence, uh, I also uh, see the parallel to that, that what ADR was is, is a social innovation uh, at the time. So the, the, the courts were not meeting society's needs. Legal institutions were not sufficiently adaptive to uh, uh, meet those needs. So ADR was a social innovation it was a novel strategy to satisfy human needs at a particular point in time in our society. And these needs were not being met by less adaptive institutions. The processes are not novel. They've been around forever. They've been, you know, in different forms and ways. We certainly have intellectualized and we've metacognitized them at some level uh, over, over the years. But the, um, I think the really novel social innovation part of it for the ADR piece of this was the intentional marriage of these processes with legal institutions. Uh, which has been done historically in other societies, but was for us uh, a kind of a new thing. Um, and, and, and that resulted in a bunch of, I think, structural legacies that we can think about. 
and this is just a partial list and you can come up with more. First of all, court-connected ADR, mediation-centric, uh, certainly, but a, a lot of institutionalization around that. The, convergent, uh, the co conversion of a, a once limited, formally inter-mercantile arbitration system into a system of private adjudication for, uh, that includes huge numbers of consumer and employment disputes and other things like that. Um, a privatized mediation and arbitration system for wealthy corporations. Uh, an increasingly exclusive professional cadre of dispute resolution professionals, mostly lawyers, and I, I, it, it, which is strangely still, in my view, a cottage industry and shouldn't be at this point in time if, we, if it really had the kind of purchase and institutionalization need that it should have. Um, isomorphism, uh, that is the, uh, the shifting of the ethos of these processes to more closely match the legal institutions in which they're being used. And, and the result from that, and I think it's a legacy of what we've done, is we've taken processes which were primarily relational and we've turned them into transactional uh, processes. And I think we have to think about the damage of that and maybe undoing that. And finally on my list, and I'm sure you can come up with it, it gave us jobs. <laughs> Now, it, I just want to point out a potential problem with social innovation is that it might conceal attempts to shift attention on structural disparities and deficiencies from group responsibility to individual responsibility. So if ADR was primarily response to an inefficient or dysfunctional civil justice system, then have we enabled ongoing disparities and structural deficiencies within that system, covered them up, shifted things to individuals rather than take group and social responsibility for the changes that were needed. And we, and we shifted too much toward private ordering uh, in, in, in this context, and should we revisit that? Uh, something to think about, and I think we, uh, we, we have a responsibility. We've been involved in that. I think we have a responsibility to evolve uh, from that to what the next constructive piece would be. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, we're going to turn, continuing with successes and failures, and ask several of our other panelists to highlight uh, first two key successes and then a couple key failures. Uh, Jean, I'm going to start with you. Two key successes you'd like to make sure we're thinking about. Sure, thank you. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and the remarks of my fellow panelists. I really like. Um, how broad and sort of high-flying and theoretical some of their comments were, and mine are going to be the opposite. I am super practical, pragmatic. Um, what brought me into this field wasn't, you know, I don't know, something very kind of high and theoretical. It was like, you know, how can we better teach lawyers? How can we better design systems? Um, I didn't come into this with sort of an I love ADR attitude. I came in with, gee, what is this? What is, is this a tool that we can use to help people? And I thought about two uh, basic pragmatic causes. One was, uh, you know, how can we uh, train lawyers, because that's what my job is and was, how can we train lawyers to better represent uh, their clients and two, how can we train future lawyers, people in society, to who will be decision makers, judges, uh, policy makers, to set up better processes for resolving disputes? And I think we've really done very well on both of those fronts with our ADR field in the last 40 or whatever years. To me, the big accomplishment in law school is not so much that we've taught new lawyers about you know this thing called mediation or this thing called negotiation. What I think is our even bigger accomplishment is to teach our law students about what disputants are really all about and that they're not just about legal problems and that they're about more personal problems and personal concerns and broader concerns and basically that we've taught our law students to think about the underlying psychology and what really makes people think. And they can apply that to the extent they take our courses, uh, they can apply that as they go out and become lawyers to be more effective negotiators and mediators and to represent people in mediation and arbitration and also as litigators. And I think our field has really added to the arsenal of talents that our future lawyers will use. And with respect to the processes um, 
that may or may not involve lawyers. So we have these court processes, administrative processes, other kinds of processes where people resolve disputes. I think what our field has done is to um, cause those people who design the processes to be much more creative and much more ambitious and less limited in their vision. So back when I was in law school quite a while ago, you know, we thought about litigation. And we thought about, okay, we're going to have courts, you know, should the judge wear red or blue, or what kind of judge should we have, or should it be a long trial or a short trial? But now we think much more broadly, not just about litigation, but all these other kinds of processes that may be connected to courts, may not be connected to courts. We can have not only all the processes that we've already imagined of, you know, court connected this and that, and mediation this and that, and arbitration and so on, but there's an infinite variety of potential future processes. And through our work in the ADR field, I think we are training those who will design those processes, whether they be, you know, online, offline, who knows what they'll be, to be more creative in designing processes to better accommodate all of the needs that people have when they try to resolve disputes. Thanks, Jean. Len, I'm going to turn this to you. Two key successes that we haven't already highlighted that you want to make sure we're thinking about. This is, this is my problem. I agree with everything my <laughs> colleagues have said. Um, so I'll probably condense some of what they said and put it in different words. Maybe I'll fool you into thinking this is something new. So um, the, the main thing, um, it seems to me that we've done is spreading the word, and when I say we, it's not entirely clear who we is, right? <laughs> uh, spreading the word about interests and starting that and putting it into writing, starting with getting to yes, and then Kerry's 1978 UCLA Law Review article, which put a lot of, of uh, examples that helped us a lot figure out what does it mean, and now all of us take the idea of interests as uh, pretty normal, not all of us, I'm sorry, all of us in this room. Uh, but about a couple of years ago, I gave a, uh, a talk to a large group of mediators, almost all of whom were retired trial court judges, and the person who invited me said, be sure to explain interests. And I said, really? <laughs> Haven't they had Training in mediation? So yes, they've all had training. <laughs> Tell them about interests. So as I was explaining interests, all of a sudden I saw a lot of brightening in the room and the judges, retired judges, were interested in interests. And finally somebody raised his hand and said, are we supposed to do that? And imagine my surprise, but most of them didn't, were not aware that that could be or maybe should be part of the mediation process, which I'm sure all of us and most of our colleagues in the world have been pushing all along. Still, we can't take credit for all of this, but now we hear about win-win and we hear about options and so forth on all kinds of television programs and in movies. Uh-oh. <laughs> Win-win. No. No, no. I, okay. I'm, I'm, yes. Okay. I agree. I Later agree with you. To be continued. Be, yeah. Um, okay. So the other thing it seems to me we've, we've done is we started out, although not all of us were aware of it, it seems to me the field started out worrying about what is most the most appropriate way to deal with conflicts and problems and so forth. Uh, it was in the first book I was in, the first edition of the book I was involved in said that flat out. I think the others, all of the others said it either explicitly or implicitly. Later, gradually, it really became a part of the lingo, uh, appropriate dispute resolution. And t to some extent, it seems to me we've stuck with that as a field. And we've been able somehow to, uh, to use the maybe new age expression, flow like the water. It seems to me the field has uh, moved into areas where there were opportunities and needs uh, to a pretty high degree. And what I see happening, what I'm hoping happens in the future is that we can continue to do that. And one arena, of course, is uh, 
online dispute resolution, which some of my mm, age peers don't find very interesting. <laughs> but I think it's obviously this is going to happen, and, and uh, we're getting into it. And I only worry a little bit about uh, mm, rivalries and so forth. Uh, but if we can keep focused on what's most appropriate, whatever that means, right, that's not simple in this situation, I think we can do a lot uh, with ODR. Um, and that we will, although I often see a lot, I, I have trouble coming up saying, talking about two successes, because I keep Thinking on the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, yeah. there's a lot of. Save those. Huh? <laughs> I'll ask you to save those thoughts. I'm going to say, are we, we will, getting close we to the back. end? Well, there's that. <laughs> those are other people's yeah. questions. Yeah, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll stop, even though Andrew has Thank explicitly you, <laughs> asked me to stop. I appreciate that. Thanks. You're Good. Welcome. We will turn. We will come back. I promise. Uh, as Sharon uh, started hinting. Um, obviously, every time we're thinking about successes, uh, and you've already seen really the challenge for every success, there is a flip side uh, to that. And so we're turning to Sharon and Tom uh, to make sure that uh, in case we haven't already started highlighting those, what are other failures? And again, still looking past. So the second half of this panel, we're, we're going to start a little bit looking forward. But uh, still looking in the past 40 years, what do you want to make sure that we are not losing as some really key failures? And Sharon, I'll turn that to you first. OK. So when Andrea first asked me to talk about failures, I was like, really? I have to talk about <laughs> failures? Like, I, I'm like an optimist. I like talking about success. But, but she actually chose us to, to respond to our things based on uh, our preliminary responses just to her as to what we identified. And so many of you know that I am probably most associated with the institutionalization of dispute resolution for my many years. I no longer say how long that I was in Florida <laughs> because I don't actually like to acknowledge how old I am. Um, although being on this panel, I. <laughs> wrote to Jean after we had our conversation. Is like, wow, I felt so old on this panel. But anyway, that's another whole other story. But I think many of my colleagues have already really highlighted uh, the failure that we have had around institutionalization. Um, there's no question in answer to the question that Carrie asked 30 years ago. Who is going to change when dispute resolution is institutionalized in the court? And I think we know the answer. It's dispute resolution. It's the appropriate dispute, dispute resolution. It's mediation that has had the significant changes. I think we all had hoped that our coming into the courts and coming into that institution, that we would change the institution. But the reality is that day by day, year by year, all of our processes, and especially mediation, because at its core, I'm a mediator. And that's the, that's the process that speaks to me. That's why I got into this field. And it, it pains me to see what has happened to mediation. It has become more and more like litigation. I think Len's story is perfect illustration of this. When you speak to experienced mediators who said, is this what we're supposed to do, is talk about interests and identify that, that's a failure. That's a major failure on our part that we have allowed things to change. I think, and I think that part of this has to do with our unwillingness to claim the definition of mediation. That, and I know that that is something that Len, you and I talked about a long time ago. But the fact that we allowed the field to morph the definition that everything that's ADR is mediation is not true. And the more we allow that to happen, the more failure that it is. So, so for me, that's the, that's the single biggest failure that, that I have. And to the extent that I um, am responsible for some of it, I, I feel badly for, for that. Although I, I still think that on balance that there, 
<laughs> that having uh, the ability to institutionalize allowed for the kind of widespread use of this. Do I have time for one more quick one, Tini? Okay, so the, the second failure that I, that I just wanted to point out is, and again, Carrie hit on this a little bit, um, that you know, mediation's roots were in the civil rights movement, and yet we have done little to move that dial. Um, when major issues happen, we aren't the ones that people turn to. And so, you know, we are on the brink of war. Why? Why with all of the time and all of the energy and all the people we have trained and all of the people that we have worked with, how are we not moving that dial and how have we not um, made more progress in that way? So I think that that's something for us to um, consider to think about and it's not just on the intellectual level. I think that we have to figure out how to operationalize more of what we're what we're doing. Thank you, Sharon. Tom? Well, first of all, I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Uh, truly an incredible discussion. You know, when I, uh, I prepared that somewhat whimsical painting for you, uh, for this, and I hope all of you will, will get a copy, it shows people on a beach looking out at this amazing vision out over Catalina Island, a burst of sunshine that's just sort of animating everything and everyone. And that's the way many of us felt about this movement uh, in its, what I would, I experienced as its earlier stages. Um, and I've been around a long time. And I have to tell you, I was having the most fun uh, just in terms of dreaming and thinking back in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and today, it feels like everything has been hedged about and boxed in in many ways. Uh, remember, I'm, I'm supposed to be the cynic here, uh, but, but it is true that I think in many respects our glass is half empty. Uh, we have not achieved that, that vision uh, that is evoked in the Berger and Sander um, discussions at the Pound Conference of a dynamic system that responds to ne the needs of people and the interests of people in a more holistic way. Uh, that is adaptable to different sorts of situations, that can be less formal, that can be less adversarial, that puts people into the driver's seat uh, in conflict, which is a very difficult proposition, quite frankly, and yet a very important one. These were all things we were thinking about. And I, I need to give you a little personal history here because it's a little bit different from many of my colleagues. We all have our narrative. Well, my narrative is, uh, first, as an architect. Um, I was trained uh, as an architect. And when I, I, I have to tell you, when I decided, after hearing a, what I thought was pretty inspiring speech by a, a city planner with a legal background, I thought, you know, I think I'll go to law school. And I had a variety of reasons for doing that, but I told one of a mentor from the architecture side, I think I'm going to law school, and he said, are you out of your mind? And I said, well, actually, I want to be a creative lawyer. And he laughed and said, don't you know that's an oxymoron? Uh, but I, de I determined to prove him wrong. Now, that wasn't the, uh, the uh, animating aspect of my whole life. It's really conflict resolution. And I have to tell you that I had great opportunity as a young lawyer to begin to uh, engage with arbitration. And even in 1981, one of the first uh, big construction mediations in the United States, it may have been the first one uh, that I know of. Um, but I, I began, I was fascinated by these things. I saw opportunities and also challenges uh, for these, um, these, these approaches. And as a law professor, I actually began to have the time to begin to experiment with them on, on the practice side. I discovered that arbitration uh, could be very expensive, very time consuming, uh, and that um, to really be a choice, uh, one needed to be deliberate. Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna have a streamlined and expedited arbitration, that's certainly possible, but it requires a commitment. It requires a degree of deliberation. At the same time, I saw the opportunities of mediation uh, I uh, had the experience during my law practice with a client who had won everything that adjudication could give his business. Um, all of the compensatory damages, attorney's fees, and in a very unusual uh, situation, punitive damages. Uh, this was everything 
that the legal system could provide remedially. And when it was over, my client said, but what about the five years of lost business? What about all those hours sitting in a room with a bunch of attorneys? There's got to be a better way. Give us a better way. And so I can't get this out of my head. Well, during uh, then my opportunity to work with these different processes, I thought mediation is a phenomenal concept, but we shouldn't just be talking about mediating litigated cases. We should be using these facilitation uh, insights and skills upstream. And back in the 1990s, I, I kind of combined all these thoughts in a piece called The Multidor Contract. And I was really thinking, you know, Sanders' vision can be embraced very, in the broadest way, in long-term contractual relationships. Uh, IP arrangements, uh, construction, all kinds of, of long-term relational uh, situations. And I actually had the opportunity to get engaged in project partnering. And I found that it actually, it really worked. Well, that never really took off. And so many things have changed, and I, I'm sensitive to time. So let me just talk a little bit about what I've observed over the years. The legal profession exerts huge gravitational pull on all of these things that we have taught. Yes. We have done a wonderful job, I think, of equipping 21st century lawyers with these insights and skills that are absolutely central to practice. But at the same time, our field, what we do and what happens in, the, in practice is dramatically affected by the legal profession and its traditional perspectives and usages and practices. So uh, we were hearing about earlier about how mediation has really been essentially changed. Jackie Nolan Haley wrote about mediation, the new arbitration. Uh, and the fact is that I, I was in a, giving a talk to a group of um, dispute resolution professionals and uh, some mediators almost got in a fight over what mediation is <laughs> and whether or not, uh, whether or not mediators uh, should use joint sessions at all. And the California mediators tended to say, oh, it's, it's all about caucus. Uh, and this is a lawyer-driven phenomenon, particularly in a place like Los Angeles. Uh, and I may be stepping on some toes of folks in the room, but the fact is um, we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Why? Is it reflexive conduct? Uh, is it because of some need of the legal representatives? Or is it really what is best for the clients? Uh, lawyers exert tremendous influences. Arbitration has drifted dramatically uh, into a kind of new litigation. It requires special efforts uh, to overcome that. I think we have boxed ourselves in in many ways. We have, prov uh, and particularly those of us who have legal backgrounds, I have to be very, very careful uh, to, uh, to not think broadly enough and to encourage our clients uh, to walk across that street and try something new. Uh, sometimes that's difficult because many, I mean, in, in the commercial arena with businesses, I know people don't like to be the first people to walk across the street, but we have to find ways to uh, embrace and, and convey that value proposition. Thanks, Tom. All right. Uh, we are going to, uh, in some ways, continue a, a little bit of the depressing theme uh, because our <laughs> next question, just to get us there, is really talking about, in some ways, current events uh, how we're operating in this world around us, um, not just uh, the fact that we're waking up to a potential war this morning, uh, but really everything that's going on in the body politic uh, and other concerning trends uh, that have been happening. So kind of moving a little bit from the past to uh, things that are concerning us today. And I'm going to let Jean kick us off there. So it's been interesting how many uh, commonalities there are between you know, the remarks that all of us have given from our, from our different perspectives. Um, I think one common theme is that we feel like you know, we've, what, whatever phrase you use, we have the great memes, we've had these beautiful ideas, we see the sunshine, you know, we see the interests, we have these great solutions. And gosh darn it, you know, it hasn't all gotten implemented yet. I mean, the frustrations are some the somewhat more mundane, maybe, Len's experience about the judges or Sharon talking about the court-connected mediation. Um, and then we have the bigger picture frustrations that, that Carrie and others talked about of, you know, there's no world peace and everything else. 
Um, so what I think is kind of interesting, and I don't know if it's depressing, I think it's just interesting to think about, so why, you know, why, if we have these great ideas, you know, why, hasn't, why haven't we brought about world peace yet? Um, and in my mind, there are two uh, kind of underlying fundamental things going on. Um, one of them is, is human nature. So I remember back to, you know, when I was in high school thinking about human nature and there's the debate about, you know, are people inherently good or are they inherently evil? Um, and I remember the essay that I wrote, which I thought was oh so brilliant at the time. Well, they're not inherently good or inherently evil, they're inherently self-interested, uh, which can be good or can be evil. Um, and I think that was, you know, simplistic now as I look back on it, but I think it's closer to the truth than either inherently good or inherently evil. The reason it's self-interested is simplistic is because it does turn out, and people have done lots of studies on this, that, you know, although we are self-interested, we also can be very collaborative and very generous, especially to those that we perceive to be within our group, however we define our group. So we're not really just about us. But we do tend to be about our group, and then the challenge becomes how to broaden that group enough that we can be collaborative enough and generous enough. But to the extent we are self-interested, which we are, gee, no surprise that some of our great tools, insights, memes, and so on and so forth haven't solved all the world's problems. And the other, I think, big challenge that we face um, is power disparities, which have been mentioned by various people on the panic panel. And, you know, um, I love that article that uh, Mark Galanter wrote many years ago. That I don't have the title exactly right, but it's basically, you know, why did the rich always get richer no matter what we do? Um, and it is no surprise that no process, whether it be ADR, litigation, or any other process, a process is not going to fix power disparities. That's not going to happen because the powerful parties, people, companies are going to be able to control and change the processes in ways that benefit them. So that is a big challenge and that is a big reason together with human nature of why all of our brilliant ideas and whatnot haven't solved the world's problems. But I don't think it's hopeless. Um, to me, the greatest hope actually has to do with um, Something that Carrie, and I think others talked about this as well, I mean, Carrie and others talked about, you know, how nice it is when we can teach about this stuff to undergraduates and large numbers of people and that that can have a bigger impact than merely talking to law students. And I think more, the answer is even to take it way earlier than that. You know, to the extent we can get these ideas into, you know, preschools, elementary schools, high schools, you know, that's where the answer really is. I actually have a son who's um, been screwing up in a lot of ways, so to help him, he's been uh, in a special camp out in the wilderness um, with a bunch of other 17-year-olds. Those 17-year-olds are learning the communication skills, learning to give positive feedback, learning about empathy, and those kids who have been troubled kids are going to come out of there, the, you know, better emissaries than any of our law students or us. And if we can get it even earlier, that's really how we can make this work. Great. Thank you, Jean. And I think I want to continue on that how. Carrie, you had written, and I'm going to turn to you next, on really how can we be operating in this world, which is depressing, uh, in order to continue to make a difference. Um, so I'm going to pick up on Jean's uh, wonderful comments. Um, I would say that I could sum up my entire career with one word, and that is and, rather than but. Um, and so I want to say that one needs to work at high levels of theory and practice. And that's what I would like to do with however many years I have remaining on this earth. Um, and as Jean pointed out, um, creating a sense and teaching anybody a sense of true empathy at the individual level is probably the most important thing anybody can do at any level at which you work. If you work with a corporate board, um, they need to develop some empathy for the uh, clients and customers of the corporations that they're dealing with. Um, teachers, uh, social workers, bankers, uh, waiters, anybody. So, um, you know, g give me any situation in which people are interacting with each other and at the individual level developing empathy and understanding um, and to work with the fact 
that although everyone may approach the world from a self-interested perspective, the best thing anybody could ever do is to try to look at somebody else and to understand them. So yesterday when I was on air coaching a young, a young kid, about 12 years old, about how to get something from her parent, she had this wonderful, wonderful problem-solving aha moment when I said, why do you think your parent would want you to get what it is that you want? Oh my God, she said. Um, and you know that, that's worth, you know, and as I uh, think back and have to give lots of speeches these days and I talk about those wonderful sunlit aha moments, that would be one of them. This kid realized for herself, just as Jean was describing, her son is learning that in order to um, effectuate that self-interest, she has to think about all the other people in her life that might help her get what she wants while they also get something. Um, that's not win-win, I'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but, but that is, uh, again, trying to, um, uh, trying to accomplish human needs. Now, I'm gonna connect that back to what I started with. And Lynn and I are um, alums of a program that we did, I don't know, 40 years ago? Um, with Jack Hemmelstein and Gary Friedman, who taught both of us uh, uh, not only mediation, but the understanding model of mediation. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that the ideas that we use there uh, came from philosophy, psychology, sociology. It was an interdisciplinary and experiential program in which we work with ideas and then try to operationalize them and structure them in very creative classrooms. And I've been teaching creatively ever since. There's not a single classroom of mine that doesn't have an experiential component, even when I'm teaching jurisprudence. Um, I will do experiential components of that. Arguments, having the students discuss the Locke, Hobbesian conflicts over what a society should look like. The idea is to make everything interactional and for people to understand. Um, to the extent that's working in the bigger conflicts in the world, it is the operationalization in, uh, at the individual level and at the diplomatic level and at the nation-to-nation -nation level of those kinds of exercises. Practically, if there is anyone in this room who is a Los Angeles mediator, I want to pick up on stuff that both Sharon and Tom said. Um, I lived in Washington for 16 years, and I came back to Los Angeles, which is where I helped found this field, and was shocked to discover when various friends of mine uh, went into mediation as parties, not as mediators, to learn that mediation had been, in my view, totally corrupted in this town. And by that I mean the people having an employment dispute not, did not sit for one second in the room with their employer. It has turned into complete caucus and shuttle diplomacy or not diplomacy in this city. So if those of you who are mediators um, hear anything from me today, at the practical level, it is what motivated, as Sharon said, what motivated us to come into mediation? And it was what Jean was talking about, and what I'm an idea that then becomes how we interrelate and talk to each other. Relational, as Tom pointed out. It is not just about solving the conflict in a task-driven moment. Everyone in a good mediation should come out feeling to be a better person, a more healed person if possible, not always, that's why no win-win, um, and some understanding of themselves and the other person and the situation they've been in, and how, as I like to say very simplistically, one can take lemons and turn them into lemonade in almost every problem. To the extent parties are kept separate, it's not mediation. Um, and I agree with Sharon that um, I don't know how we did it or what happened, but we got, as I said 30 years ago, we got co-opted by the processes. Um, it was very exciting to be brought into courts and institutions to help them design ADR processes. And as a system designer, I watched the World Bank and the UN and the International Red Cross take some of our ideas and internalize and institutionalize them for efficiency and other goals. So the big ideas are the values that this field was founded by, and they need to be linked um, at the teaching and instructional level to almost everything that we do. And I, I think you're hearing some wonderful ideas from the panel. Thanks, Carrie. Tom, you had written about uh, what you're doing to kind of bring ethics and, and making the reference to Lincoln in mm -hmm. terms of dealing with the current situation. So I just want to pick up on that. Well, I come from uh, Illinois, and we're one of uh, three states that claim Abraham Lincoln. But I think to some extent, all <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to make uh, regular pilgrimages to the Lincoln shrines uh, as a child. And uh, you know, as an adult, I've gotten closer and closer uh, to Abe. And I have to tell you that on close inspection, uh, he's every bit as real and even more interesting and wonderful uh, because he's a human being. Uh, with warts and all. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things um, 
that we need is uh, good exemplars today. Our teach I'm, I believe more and more uh, we need to think on certain things. We need to think about the principles that animate our lives. Uh, we, need to, we need to think about the words uh, that represent the values that we stand for. Uh, when I came to Pepperdine, you know, I wondered, I, I knew this uh, institution has a connection to uh, a religious denomination, and I thought, will this be something that is limiting to me? Will, will I have to, uh, to, to, in some respects, uh, tailor my thinking? Quite the contrary, I think if the, the, the one thing that um, Pepperdine does in its mission is to say, be your best. Um, attain the highest for the human race. Now, that could be a lot of different things, but what it means is that we're constantly trying to think about uh, how we spend our time, uh, what are our animating principles and values. Yours might be somewhat different from mine, and yet I think there are certain basic things that we need to be talking about. We need to talk about integrity. We need to talk about honesty, for goodness sake just basic stuff and it needs to be repeated over and over and over again. Um, I, don't, uh, I think a lot of us are having some real issues navigating the present political environment uh, and it's because of lack of integrity by leaders uh, and it makes a huge difference in people's daily lives and the direction of the human race. Uh, Lincoln was someone who had uh, many challenges. Uh, he had insecurities. He dealt with depression. Uh, he uh, was, uh, like all of us, uh, a, a child of his, his background uh, and had certain prejudices. Uh, but to his credit, he recognized that he could change. He could be better. He could learn from experience. Uh, and you see this animating his own life. Uh, he almost fought a duel in 1842, something that people, that very few people know about because he was embarrassed and really tried to, to hide it. But just like Alexander Hamilton, he rode out to an island uh, away from the state of Illinois. And why? Because he had slandered someone uh, in a pseudonymous letter in a political newspaper. It wasn't the Gettysburg Address. It was pretty ugly. But he learned from that experience. Uh, they didn't fight the duel. Actually, their friends mediated the dispute and got them out of it got them away from Bloody Island, and Lincoln remembered that lesson. He never wrote another pseudonymous letter. He never slandered someone in an ugly uh, piece of writing. Uh, and as we know, he, uh, he became uh, the model that many Americans now identify, uh, along with, with George Washington and other leaders. Um, so, you know, I think we, it really does make a difference how, what we fill our brains with. Uh, and we need, we need to be thinking about inculcating these basic principles uh, in, uh, in our students uh, and modeling, uh, modeling these same things. And I think having great exemplars uh, is a terrific way of, uh, of helping to do that. All right, thanks, Tom. All right, uh, next question. Uh, we wanted to end uh, on, a, on a higher note and to think more positively about the last 40 years and what legacy and impact that has had on each of us personally. Uh, and so kind of looking back, uh, what has had, what, what's been the most professionally gratifying part of being in this field? Um, how has working in this field impacted you? Uh, and we're gonna turn to Doug, Len, and Sharon for this, and then with a little bit of time, uh, hopefully popcorn around back to everybody. But um, Doug, I'm gonna start with you on this. Uh, I just wanted to note how Lincoln escalated that uh, dispute slightly by, on the dueling ground, uh, when uh, given choice of weapons, uh, he was fighting, uh, he was challenged by someone who was extremely short, and he was very tall, and so he chose uh, cutlasses uh, where the parties had to be a certain amount away from each other, <laughs> where he could easily lop the other guy's head off and the other guy couldn't touch him. It just, it just enraged. Let me, I'm just, I'm actually writing on this, so let me pick up, Doug is, 
the, we're the only two people that have written about this. But let me let me let me tell you. Um, I think that was a strategic move on Lincoln's part. He was planning, I understand, to disarm Mr. Shields. And in fact, when they got to the island, he was swinging this cavalry saber around uh, and trying to hit low-hanging branches to intimidate the guy. So meanwhile, their friends are trying to say, OK, Lincoln, you're going to apologize. He's going to accept it. And they finally got out of there. But uh, you know, one problem was that they had one of the seconds, the seconds who were actually supposed to be trying to uh, you know, make the arrangements, but also end the conflict if possible, often would get in duels themselves because they get so <laughs> animated by the conflict. And Lincoln had a second who was a very bellicose kind of person. So anyway, more on that later. More I'm sure you're all in here. Thank you, and more so, on that later. Yeah. All right, Doug, I, back to you. I am going to have a conference probably in a year or so about dueling oh, okay. internationally. <laughs> and uh, and, we'll, uh, and I, I want to... I want to have it uh, sort of focused toward, you know, we, we should be good seconds, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. we, should, we should really learn how to be good seconds, and there's a lot to learn there. And, I think uh, that's and, another plenary. And, and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I guess to go to the personal, I think uh, one of the things is I've learned to be a better second uh, in all this. But I, um, I, I'd, I'd start out by saying, well, it, like Garrett Morris said and all this and else get baseball been very, very good to me. <laughs> And, uh, or you could take the Bran Stark approach from Game of Thrones. Well, you know, if it hadn't been, I wouldn't be here. And uh, y'all aren't getting that. Is it, is it just, okay. Uh, I, I, did, I don't know how many of you took Roger Fisher's workshops in the 80s, uh, but one of the things that they started pushing early on was the idea of personal congruency, that... Um, that what the teaching negotiation that, that that these negotiation techniques they had to be personally congruent, you know you had to figure out how to make it all congruent with yourself and all that sort of thing, and I started out my academic life as a primatologist, and uh, and drifted into law as a litigator, uh, and and then drifted into ADR, uh, and it suddenly I suddenly realized that was sort of congruent. It all sort of began to fit. And I'm ending my professional career as a primatologist again, in an odd sort of way. Uh, and I, I just have to say that it's, it, ADR has given me a congruency uh, in my professional life, and somewhat in my personal life, too. Uh, and uh, it's given me a kind of a, a philosophical framework to sort of look at the world uh, that's been very helpful, I think, personally to me. And I, I think probably many of you feel that way, too. Uh, so I, I'm. And it's given me a career, it gave me a job. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that would be my Great. take All on it. All right, thank you. Len, let me turn this to you. So um, just, I have a lot to say that's quite similar to what uh, Doug just said. Um, as Carrie mentioned, we both started out with a group that was promoting humanistic education for lawyers, very psychologically oriented and a little bit spiritually oriented. Uh, and it certainly influenced what I wanted to do uh, with mediation. So my idea was to, what else, save the world. I had previously tried to save the world with earth shoes. I don't know if any of you remember <laughs> them. And years later, years later, I found out they had ruined my knees. Um, so it didn't work. Now, this one hasn't quite worked either. Um, but I think bo in both cases, it was a little unrealistic to think I was going to save the world because I had this really cool way of doing mediation. And it was also unreal. Yeah, it was also unrealistic to think that people were going to buy Earth shoes or people were going to start mediating the way Jack and Gary taught us. Um, and we were not, I was not paying attention to the realities of of human behavior and patterns and, and, and reflexive behavior and self-centeredness and group affiliations and all that stuff. Um, and I also wasn't paying attention enough to the predecessors, like the code duella for dueling, which in aspects, Doug has written about this beautifully, uh, is uh, interest-based negotiation. Um, and there are other predecessors, and one of the 
difficult things about getting to yes is they make no reference whatever to anyone who said anything else about this. And Bruce Patton told me that's because they didn't know. They just made it up. But in fact, <coughs> a lot of, of, of ideas and behaviors and practices are built into our, in some sense, DNA, uh, and we don't realize it. So uh, I've been reading and watching uh, this idea of your inner fish. I don't know how, how many of have, are familiar with this. The idea being that we are genetically a lot like fish for a while, and then we're a lot like reptiles and so forth. Yeah. And that stuff is still in us in, in some way, and it would help to recognize it. And to bring that back now to mediation, it seems to me the whole, I, maybe I'm just trying to get myself out of a jam because I know at least seven or eight people in the room think it's all my fault what happened to mediation, right? <laughs> But I think we were overstepping a little when we started saying that mediation involves uh, human interaction and face-to-face -face and all that. We, we didn't invent mediation, and mediation has taken many, many forms over many generations. Um, and so what I think I've, I've, I've come back to what we studied in 1980 about uh, conflict resolution, a little meditation, and a certain form of psycho, uh, uh, psychotherapy called, at the time, psychosynthesis. And I've come back to all of that now because I'm just finishing a book about negotiation, mindfulness, meditation, and something called internal family systems, which is almost the same thing exactly as psychosynthesis, except the people who write about it are much clearer. And <laughs> so, those who, so, so those of you who are familiar with psychosynthesis know what I mean. So the, what this field has done for me is allowed me to pursue my own interests, allowed me to think I'm helping people, allowed me to realize I'm not really, and uh, so I could maintain my humility, right, for which I am renowned, uh, right? Oh, yeah. And, so it's been uh, wonderful for me in that way, uh, and I'm glad I had the opportunity. And I, I think we have to acknowledge, we're not going to save the world, that all these same issues we've been dealing with, people have dealt with before, and will continue to deal with them. Uh, and we've made a huge amount of progress helping various people in various programs uh, even though most of the mediations in this country, probably 92.5% or more, aren't anything like what we, those of us who were inventing mediation, were talking about, still lots of the mediations are. And I will defer to uh, carry about win-win. I, I agree it's not, I shouldn't have used it here. <laughs> I can use it with a different group, <laughs> so I apologize. That's all, Great. thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So, you know, as, I, as I'm listening to everyone, I realize that there's one thing that I'm a little bit different about, and that is that I started law school knowing I wanted to do dispute resolution. I went to law school knowing I would never practice law, and I never did. Uh, I not even one moment um, <laughs> in, during my three years of law school or afterwards did I work in a law firm or clerk or do anything remotely, traditionally, legally um, focused. I, I, so for me, um, I've always had a difficult time separating my personal life from my professional life in that, for me, the values, that, that congruence that you talked about has been really central. And so I am so grateful for this feel that I have been able to uh, be a part of. And um, I want to take a page from um, Suk Simran and, and uh, acknowledge my mentor and, and uh, initial trainer, which is Josh Stolberg, um, who I had the good fortune to meet when I moved back from, uh, after law school, moved back to New York and took a job um, in a New York City public high school running a peer mediation program. And so one, I would say for me, the the most gratifying 
aspect of the career that I've had so far is that I had the ability to work both on the micro level and the macro level. I, I have found it incredibly gratifying to work with high school students and to see that light bulb go on over their head. Students who had never once considered, when asked the question, what do you do when faced with a conflict, had never once considered that there was another alternative than fight. Like, would look at me and say, oh, trick question, you know? And, and then to discover that actually, that they could talk to each other. And I quite agree, we need to move that back even, you know, way before high school, because at that point, too much of their life had passed without them understanding that they could do other things. And then I had the opportunity to work in Florida and look at policy development and systemic kinds of things and, and look at systems and, and try to think on the macro level, how do you change people's lives in a, in a major way? And then for sort of the third chapter in, in my professional career to, to be able to go to academia and to uh, be the director of the Dispute Resolution Institute, which I never would have done, I never would have gone to academia if it wasn't for being the director of the institute. Um, I happen to really love working in administration and teaching and having that dual. I know it's weird, nobody else likes that, but I do. Um, so, so for me to have sort of that, that ability both to um, touch individuals, I continue to mediate and continue to have that one-on-one -on -one experience as well as thinking about that, that macro and so it's, um, I said, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to have done that and continue. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just going to popcorn around uh, since we blessedly have just a few minutes. Um, so uh, Carrie, Tom, or Jean, if there was anything that's most gratifying or a legacy or a one or two word thought that you want to make sure <laughs> we are setting people off for the rest of the conference with. Um, so I just want to pop into the popcorn popper, a word that hasn't come up here, and that's why I started my career, and that was to be a litigator and to seek justice. And we've talked about a lot of things here, um, interest-based for me, needs-based negotiation, mediation, solving problems, but an important part of this work for me was another goal or value, and that was to achieve justice. Um, and since Sharon mentioned New York, I've been a little obsessed in the last two weeks with the Central Park Five. I was in New York when a lot of it happened. If you all haven't seen When They See Me, I recommend looking at it. There have been proposals in the press, for example, to use what I'm most proud of, and that is working a little bit on restorative justice, that is to take criminal law, which is very polarized, adversarial, and supposedly seeking justice, um, and I'm not the only one here, a lot, many of you, to work on really other ways to totally reconfigure our justice system. And restorative justice is one way to do it. And I don't mean if you saw it, the LA Times last week had a wonderful um, and, and controversial, I'm going to teach with it, op-ed by uh, Laura Bazelon, who teaches in San, San Francisco, and has been a criminal defense advocate, um, imagining a um, restorative justice session with Linda Fairstein, who is uh, <laughs> no longer anybody's hero, um, and having issues, and, uh, and Elizabeth Lederer, to have them sit in a restorative justice circle with the Central Park Five. Um, so when I say think of new memes or new ideas, um, it's a great thought experiment to imagine what that would be like. It's a very dramatic moment because, again, a lot of people watching the show, it's been uh, uh, engaging a lot of people. And so I would say for me, the exciting moments have been when something really, really new worked in some way, but always motivated, um, not just by um, interest-based negotiation, but also achieving justice. Um, uh, you know, m many of my articles uh, say peace and justice. I said and, I told you that's very important. And so while we were all seeking peace, it is also important when there's grave injustice to think about um, how ADR, if at all, can contribute to that. And when it can't, as in the moment it's having a problem, um, I'm looking for other ways to achieve justice. ADR is one of the thing, one of the many things I do. Some of you know that I write in a lot and I teach in a lot of other fields. It's one of the things I do. So I'm trying to figure out um, to what extent is ADR serving justice, and when it's not, what else should we be doing? Great. Thank you, Jean. 
Any popcorn thoughts before we close? No, like Lynn, I want to be renowned for my humility. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be one of the takeaway phrases, clearly. I am renowned for my humility. That's, absolutely. Tom, any last thoughts? Um, community and creativity. I think uh, I have been a fan as well as a friend of many of the people in this room. And I think, um, to me, it's all about a mutual support uh, in many, many respects. Um, uh, that's what this conference is all about. And I really hope that this will be a fount of our communitarian approach uh, to resolutions of all kinds of different sorts of problems that will be a seed for uh, uh, planted uh, for lots of lots of new fruits and vegetables that uh, to arrive in the future. So I'm uh, I'm just uh, I'm thrilled. Okay. Thanks. Well, good. I will uh, use the last few minutes in moderator's prerogative, but just to close with a few words. Uh, lots of thoughts for us to obviously uh, consider as we start off the next two days in terms of successes and for every success of flowing through law schools and being everywhere and, um, and being institutionalized, the flip side of obviously being institutionalized in ways that we are not necessarily delighted with. Uh, the forms and processes, um, and having our ideas uh, at the high theory level, and maybe not having everyone call us when there is a problem, either in current events or otherwise, uh, in thinking about that as well. Um, pursuing justice, and whether it's only lawyers uh, that should be doing that, um, and really what we've heard is some of the push to think about who else and where else we should be targeting um, some of our theories for education and moving forward. Uh, so lots of good things for us to all pick up on. Um, I'll just note uh, for me, as we were uh, having fun chatting uh, kind of initially, thinking about the legacy uh, and the personally gratifying part of being in this field. Um, a, it is having good friends who take ideas that you pop off at conferences and then throw <laughs> together a giant conference uh, with all of your friends in the room. So it is wonderful to be with everybody. Um, and for me personally, uh, and some of you know this, it was uh, taking a class. I did not go to law school thinking that I would end up doing this. Uh, taking a class in negotiation, kind of going, ooh, this is much more interesting than everything else uh, that I came here to study. Uh, and being able to pull something uh, that I think of as, um, I like that phrase, congruence. Um, and, uh, and I was asked years ago, um, actually, also at a school of faith of, to give a talk literally to the Board of Trustees, what's a nice Jewish girl like me teaching at a Jesuit institution? Um, and that was the title of the talk uh, to the Board of Trustees at Marquette. Um, but it was really all talking about this personal congruence of getting to pursue one's values uh, in what one taught. And I teach ethics. Uh, I used to teach international law. Um, and it's really all about how we want people to behave, um, which might not be the reality some of the time. Uh, it's not the reality. Of, uh, of our government, oftentimes, of other governments, of individuals, um, or even of the law students that we train. Uh, but it is, I think, our overarching um, optimism and our goal that links us in this in terms of how we'd like the world to be. Um, and so as we are thinking for the next two days uh, about what we can do to contribute, both what we have contributed already um, and where do we go from here so that we are achieving a more just, a more perfect world as we're, not perfect, but uh, looking for justice and peace and truth and apple pie and all of those wonderful things. Um, and with that, uh, thank you all for participating. Thank I am you. sending us off on our first break. I was gonna say, Sharon, you were. You know, I, I was going to explain to everybody. We will be taking a, a break in two minutes. So if so you can please be with us for you know, two minutes, we'll be taking a break. So A successful adult. So great. Thank you all. So <laughs> please, there's a quick announcement about colleagues of ours who are here from Tribute Booth. They have a booth set up outside this room to the left in the entrance of the library. Speaking of taking ideas and spreading to next generation, one thing we all know is next generation is very social media savvy and video savvy then uh, voice message or text message heavy, we all know. But what we need from you is some messages. 
your videos, your you being on social media, you talking about dispute resolution so that we spread the word. There are many people around Earth that still do not know where this field is, how far we can take, and the wonderful ideas being shared here. So I've got two colleagues to very quickly who can say hi to Perry and RJ. <laughs> Look, they're nice people. They're going to work with you, right? So. Thank you for the terrific panel. One more time, let's take a break. <laughs>